This next video in our Maintaining a Balance series will be looking at the dot points distinguished between active and passive transport and relate these processes, sorry, two processes occurring in the mammalian kidney and explain why the processes of diffusion and osmosis are inadequate in removing dissolved nitrogenous wastes in some organisms. So we're going to start off with having a look at uh, a quick overview of what active and passive transport is. We have discussed these a few times, but this will just help to bring our memories back. So active transport is movement that requires the input of cellular energy. So that is ATP that is produced by the mitochondria through the process of respiration, which we've talked about quite a bit. It involves movement across, uh, sorry, movement occurs against the concentration gradient. So uh, from an area where there's a low concentration to a high concentration, and some examples that occur in the kidneys include the reabsorption of sodium ions from the urine. So that's dependent on feedback from the body. So if we need to retain some salt, then reabsorption will take place. Now, passive transport does not require any energy as movement occurs along the concentration gradient. So we move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So some examples that we've talked about quite extensively through year 11 and so far in year 12 are osmosis and diffusion. So we have the two types of passive transport, diffusion, which is the movement of any molecules from high to low solute concentration until equilibrium is reached. So as we can see here, we have a high concentration of green uh, solutes on the left-hand side and a low concentration towards the right. So the green solutes will spread out across the whole solution until there's an equal amount throughout the whole blue area. Osmosis is the movement of water from high to low water concentration through a selectively permeable membrane. So remember, if we don't include that last bit about being across a selectively permeable membrane, technically we have not defined the term osmosis. So as we can see in the second picture there, there's a higher concentration of water outside the cell, a lower concentration inside um, in the salt solution. So water will move uh, across the semi-permeable membrane to try to equalize that. This is just a cute little picture I found, a little meme of osmosis. So it says diffusion of molecules from a place of high concentration to a place of lower concentration until the concentration on both sides is equal. So technically this meme is incorrect because it's showing the movement of cat particles where we know that osmosis is simply the movement of water particles. So passive transport moves water via osmosis and some nitrogenous wastes such as urea and ammonia via diffusion. Unicellular organisms are able to rely on passive transport for the sole excretion of nitrogenous wastes. And this is because the large surface area to volume ratio of these unicellular organisms ensures that these processes occur e easily and effectively. Now, during the movement of substances with passive transport, only excess water and salts are excreted. So it's only if we've got too much of these two things that, um, that they're excreted. However, sometimes uh, when we're not in excess of these two substances, we still need to be able to remove them from our bodies. So some a limitation of using passive transport includes a need for the difference in concentration of substances. So if there isn't a difference in substances inside and outside of the structure that we're removing them from, then it's not going to take place. And another problem is that these processes are relatively slow and sometimes we require quick uh, removal of wastes in order to stop them from building up. So active transport can sometimes involve a carrier protein that spans the membrane and actively moves chemicals. So some of the substances that are moved include sodium, glucose, amino acids, and hydrogen ions across the wall of the nephron. Okay, so we'll recall that the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. So that is the bit that does all the work of the kidney in uh, removing water, saving water, removing other substances, etc. So as we can see in the picture there, okay, we have an opposite movement of substances. So the solutes are the... Um, the blue ball, the sorry, the the blue little balls. So they move across from where there's a few of them to where there's more of them. So a sodium pump mechanism operates in the kidney tubules, which actively transports ions from the urine back into the kidney cells. So this process helps to conserve salt and brings about conservation of water, as the active transport of salt draws water out of the urine by osmosis. So as the salt gets drawn out, then it changes the concentration of water and then the water moves out through the passive process of osmosis. 
So some problems on relying on diffusion. So the rate of movement of substances is too slow. Nitrogenous wastes and toxins must be dissolved when they are removed. Wastes would only move if they were more concentrated inside the cell than the bloodstream. As concentration equalizes, movement would slow down. When equalized, no further wastes would be removed and then they would start to accumulate. And all, not all wastes are able to be removed by the process of diffusion. So what about some problems of relying on osmosis? So too much water may be lost. If the urine contains high concentrations of nitrogenous wastes, water will automatically be drawn out to help equalize the concentration. Movement of water may take wastes, uh, sorry, may make wastes too dilute for excretion. Excretion of dilute urine equals or leads to large losses of water and therefore dehydration. And in freshwater fish, osmosis results in water moving into cells, diluting toxic wastes and slowing excretion by diffusion. So why do we need to use active transport? Multicellular organisms are too large to rely on the processes of osmosis and diffusion to remove nitrogenous wastes. Because we're made up of many, many cells that all have different functions, waste cannot simply diffuse across a single cell membrane to leave the organism like in our unicellular organisms. So you know, as we said, unicellular organisms have a very high surface area to volume ratio. So the movement of substances in and out across that membrane is quite easy. Complex organisms must therefore find another way to remove the wastes where the substances can be moved against a concentration gradient. And this is why active transport is required. So active transport is much quicker and much more effective than passive transport. It's able to pump salts from the urine back into the kidneys and it in turn draw water with them by osmosis. So this allows for the regulation of salt and water concentration. As I've said a few times now, this depends on feedback from the body based on hormones, which we'll be, we'll be having a look at in the next couple of lessons. And the body will draw salt and or water back in depending on what's needed. So active transport ensures that the amount of water lost in the urine does not affect the body's overall water balance. So if our water levels drop too much can lead to problems with a lot of our different organs. Okay, one big thing to note, however, is that water cannot be moved directly by active transport. So we do require both passive and active transport to take place in order for the effective movement of both water and the nitrogenous wastes and salts that we need to get rid of. So that's it for today's video on uh, the processes involved in moving substances in passive and active transport and why active transport is much uh, more effective in doing this than simply passive transport alone.